He's the author of his new book, Off Mike, and also last week announced his retirement. It will be a bummer not to hear him call so many great events for the National Hockey League and for NBC Sports, and he has done so much in his incredible, decorated career. Mike Emmerich, Doc Emmerich here on The Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Doc? Richard, how are you? I am very well, Michael. Thank you for calling into this program. I have a question for you. Oh, my gosh. Let's roll. What do you have? Uh... Tampa Bay Lightning won the Stanley Cup and had their parade, which was kind of on the water downtown in Tampa. Mm -hmm. So if the Rays win, we would gather there might be some sort of a replica of that. But what would the Dodgers do? Well, as you know, there is a river here in Los Angeles, but it depends on the day whether it exists or not. Um, An interesting Yeah, and all the circumstances make it really hard. You know, when you don't win since 88... And you you have a celebration. You would want it to be something really special, but how can it be with given the circumstances? Uh, it's I, it's it's a tough thing. I'm sure they would enjoy planning it, but it would certainly have to be difficult. No doubt that about that. And uh, Doc, you bring up 1988, and certainly here in Los Angeles, that's a special year, as you were remarking about uh, the last time that the Dodgers won the World Series, and it is also uh, famous for one of Vince Scully's most in- uh, iconic calls of of the moment that Gibson went yard. Uh, I, I just want to give you the floor on what your favorite calls maybe of all time are of somebody else's, Mike. Well, that would be one of them, and here is the night in 88 that happened. Bill Clement and I are at the Forum in Inglewood across town. Yes. Describing the Philadelphia Flyers and the and the Kings. And there's a a circle to circle defensive zone pass between two Flyers defensemen and for a reason that we can't at the time explain, an enormous roar goes up from the crowd at the forum. And what has just happened is Kirk Gibson's home run. <laughs> and we don't know about that until later on. And so that is why that night still stays in my memory bank, because it was one of those nights that you had no idea what happened because it was an inconsequential play. But, boy, the crowd was sure into it, weren't they? You thought a D-to-D have... pass, and they erupted like crazy. You might have thought it was like maybe a delayed <laughs> penalty or something. Instead, it was just a, a delayed piece of information coming your way. And, you know, I, I, again, I just was wondering, again, uh, your sense of uh, another announcer meeting the moment, knowing what it takes yeah. to actually do that. Yeah, well, that would be one of them. And I think any situation where any guy that I've heard got away and let the crowd do the talking. And I I think that uh, that same night, Jack Buck did the same thing Mm -hmm. uh, after he said, I don't believe what I just saw. Uh, But but to let the crowd do it and let the guys in the truck show the pictures uh, that they are there to show. I think that means a lot. I remember Lasorda running from the dugout, mm-hmm. and actually the camera jiggling some because how how the vibration That's within right. Dodger Stadium was going. That's right. Gosh, I'm getting goosebumps, and I'm not even a Dodger fan. The Pirates haven't even won since '79, <laughs> and that's my team. Yeah. Um, it 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 is marvelous, though, isn't it? That we. Th- and the, there was uh, there was a collection of of uh, highlights of all time great uh, sports calls, and the title of it was "And the Crowd Roared." And of course, we missed that this year in hockey. We didn't have crowds, but at least there are some that are going to be present at the game tonight. There are going to be some people there. I seem to hear the Dodger fans a little more um, when when something good happens for them, but maybe that's just because the microphones that I'm hearing are picking them up more. But it's marvelous to think back during when you're as old as I am, uh, to think back during the time when some teachers in your school would let you listen to World Series games Mm. uh, during school because we didn't start having World Series games at night until 1971. And so I was a part of that culture that was in secondary and junior high school when it was just understood that the good teachers – the nice ones would take time out and you just miss talking about school that day. So you could listen with the radio all the way up to the world series. And that day 
the girls in the class would just have to tolerate it. <laughs> Hall of Fame hockey announcer and uh, also umpteen Emmy Award winner Mike Doc <laughs> Emmerich joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. And we were just talking about iconic you know, calls and moments. And you mentioned Jack Buck, his son Joe, just had a wild, wild end of a game in World Series Game 4 over the weekend. And I'm wondering what that would be for you in your career, the wildest finish you ever called and you didn't see coming, um, and and it happened. What about for you, Doc? Well, we knew there was going to be uh, there was going to be an end, but with multiple overtime games, you just never know. There were two probably, and they were both four overtime games. One involved two of the greatest goaltenders of all time. Both are, are in the Hall of Fame: Dominic Hasek, who was playing for Buffalo, sure. and Marty Brodeur, who was playing for New Jersey. It was in 1994, and it was a playoff series between the two teams at the old odd in Buffalo. And, of course, it went well past midnight because it was four overtimes. There were 120 shots in the game, and the 120th was the only one that went in. A guy named Dave Hannon scored it for Buffalo, and it beat Brodeur. But there were shots that went off the post. Stefan Riche of New Jersey had a couple of breakaways, was stoned on one, hit the post on another. But all night long, no goal scored after the warm-up. That was it uh, until Hannon scored. And that was the sixth game, and that forced a seventh game back in New Jersey, of all things. And Dale Howarchuk was stoned by Brodeur late in the last 10 seconds or so of the third period in a one-goal game in New Jersey won and eventually went on and faced New York uh, Rangers. But the other one was the Easter Eve game that Bill Clement and I were fortunate enough to broadcast on ESPN a game seven between the Islanders and Washington in 1987. And uh, it went uh, until about uh, 20 till two in the morning. And uh, it, it was uh, a a gallant war between two teams that was going to be settled sometime. And as it turned out, it was a wheeling shot by another hall of famer, Pat LaFontaine that, glanced off the post and went in and uh, the Islanders won the game and moved on to Philadelphia by bus and played them just with a, with a partial day's rest. The next day started the next round of the playoffs. But I think those two would stand out in my mind for sure. Well, they certainly did. And, and, you know, you have such a way with words, doc. Uh, It's, it really is just wonderful to just take in and listen to and, I'm wondering, you know, uh, I, I want to give you the floor on on this, just in terms of exciting moments in sports, right? Uh, you've got to have something like maybe uh, if it's a, a running back or a wide receiver that's breaking into the clear or in baseball, there's something hitting the gap. Can it go for, you know, second to third? And can somebody come home? And basketball, it might be, you know, uh, the clock winding down and you know it's the game's going to be won or not for me in hockey it's the rush of the puck in a playoff overtime I, I i'm wondering if you would agree with that and if so describe for me what makes that so great since you've seen it and described it so well for so long yeah i i agree with you and and what often leads to that Um, which adds to the drama of the event is when the goalie is pulled in the last minute that Mm. gets the game to overtime because when the goalie's pulled, a lot of times it's a one-goal game. And the ultimate form of hockey's Russian roulette where you take a chance to try and get the game tied and force overtime. And probably the best example of what you're talking about and what I'm talking about was the epitome of what I think hockey was about and it was seen by the largest audience i ever got to broadcast to 27 million uh the gold medal game in 2010 in vancouver um the goalie was pulled in the last minute and out of a mouse scramble zach parisi of the united states scored to force overtime and then uh out of a half boards play rather than an end-to-end rush which is far more exciting but usually with today's defensive schemes it's not allowed very much um, the puck came to Sidney Crosby, and he was able to score on Ryan Miller of the United States and, and win the game in overtime and the gold medal to Canada. But I think the thing that struck me about that whole event was it, it really summarized the best of hockey, and the greatest number of people got to see the game. And many of them were not hockey fans on that last Sunday of the Olympics in 2010. 
uh, because Pierre Maguire was not working for us, but had been during the whole Olympics. And so we had the rights to take his interviews, which were done for the Canadian network with Ryan Miller, the losing goalie and with Sidney Crosby, the winning goal scorer. And the interviews that they gave were typically gentlemen's interviews praising the other team, talking about good things that happened in the game, and really showed the best of what hockey athletes are. And we got those on before the medal ceremony took place. And many people that were watching the end of that game, because it went longer than most games, got to not only see the winning goal, but also got to see the conversations with two great players. And then... The closing ceremony took place uh, an hour, two hours later. I don't remember the exact time frame. I was never prouder to be around the sport, and there have been many times that I have, than I was that day because so many people got to see the best of what this is all about. The brilliant Mike Doc Emmerich, a few more minutes left uh, here on our conversation on the Rich Eisen Show. And we, you know, Mike, we take, we take, um, great announcers for granted. We always do. It's just that we, that the big game that we love to watch so much uh, it comes on, and we we expect to hear the voice because it makes us comforted to hear the voice. That it's you know announcers become part and parcel of our family in a way, uh, and we sometimes forget it's a human being that's actually needing to prepare and needing to work and needing to raise their game to that level and needing to get on a plane, needing to sit in a hotel or sleep in a hotel away from family. I mean, the great pitcher turned broadcaster Don Drysdale passed away in one, to be you know, fully honest. And that's my preamble to ask the simple question of why retire, Doc? Why now? Um, I'll try to uh, answer this in, the, in, in a concise way, if I possibly can. Uh, it came to a point somewhere between the second and third rounds of the playoffs, that would have been shortly after Labor Day this year, that I was being so protected by NBC, and they had given me the right to stay at home and work the first two rounds, as well as the option to stay at home during the third round and the final. And I thought to myself, wow, they have protected me to the hilt here, and I'm completing the 50, 47th year of broadcasting, but the 50th year since I first covered an NHL game, mm. my 40th year of doing NHL television. And I have been blessed, aside from the cancer scare, with good health. And here it is. I'm 74, going on 75. My wife is healthy, too. This seems like a very good time in my life to... to put down the headset microphone and to celebrate the years that we still have of good health. And God only knows how many uh, months or years that might be. And also to look back with pleasure on the many people that have been able to help me along and get me the opportunities that have led me to walk in and get in free to so many wonderful events. And so that's it. At age 65, I got a chance uh, to turn to the New Jersey Devils, who had been good to me for 21 years, and I followed them uh, with their games and uh, at that time not do their games anymore. And that was a hard break because we'd been through a lot together, but uh, it was a time when I needed to do less. And at age 70, uh, NBC allowed me to do fewer games as well. I was doing two games a week, which involved, as you alluded to, uh, a lot of travel, because each game involved three days, a day to travel so that I could do the practices and the game on the second day, and then travel home the third day. So six out of seven days to do two games in a week. And then uh, at age uh, uh, 70, I dropped that back to just a game a week, plus, of course, all four rounds of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, and the playoffs are very busy for two months, but that was fine because it's the most exciting time. And then came this year when it seemed like just the right time to walk away. So it is taxing, but it is fun. And it does provide you with some magnificent memories of times past, which I'm enjoying now. Well, and, and times past and memories are what this book is all about. Off Mike, how a kid from basketball crazy Indiana became America's <laughs> NHL voice. Uh, before, I, before I let you go, um, I, I, you've been so giving to so many people, you know, all of us in our industry know 
um, what many people might not, is you've given out your email address publicly to invite those who want to get in the business to maybe find out how they can become uh, a voice of a sport uh, that they didn't expect to be when they were growing up in whatever state they are in. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this book lends a credence to a lot of all that, Mike. Yeah, I still uh, still get some uh, submissions from uh, from various announcers, some of whom are now because I've been doing it for a while. Some of whom are now in the NHL. I don't have anything to do with them getting there. You <laughs> know, Rich, if you have the talent, you get there, and if not, you don't. What I've provided is what was provided me 40 years ago, and that was an opinion that maybe you can take the best of anybody's opinion and learn from it. And through repetition and through concentrating on your work, improve as the years go on. But uh, I am always so proud to learn of someone who sent me an email, and I listened to their work years ago, uh, earning a living in the business, because it is wonderful, isn't it? You get a good seat for the game. You get in free. Mm -hmm. You get to work with some of the best athletes. And then uh, as uh, your years go on, you get a couple of uh, checks in the mail each month <laughs> or you get a direct deposit into your bank account. And it's it's just a wonderful way to earn a living. And I encourage people to do it, even though there's a lot of rejection and you don't always get the jobs you want. Uh, don't quit, because if you believe in yourself and have the talent, you're going to get there. Well, you've heard the cries for many people, certainly here in Los Angeles, to see if Vin would do another inning or another game, and he has yet to do that. Is there any any thought maybe down the road you would, or is this it? You've called your last game. You have hung up your, your No, this is, this is it. Yeah. But I am so grateful to have gotten a phone call, and I am so sorry that I was not able to pick up the phone call that I got on the weekend, and I plan to return it on his birthday because he is a November baby. Is that, and that was from Vin. Is that right? You got a missed call from Vin? <laughs> I, I got a missed call from Vin. And the first thing I'm going to do when I call him on his birthday is wish him happy birthday. And the second thing is to apologize. Okay. <laughs> well, I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. And if you don't mind, I'm going to keep calling you and get you back on here because you're just one of the greatest storytellers. And uh, I'll, I'll, I will miss your voice. I'll be very honest with you. So I, I'd love to uh, you. you know, give you that uh, invitation if you're willing to accept it uh, as much of as course. possible. You, you guys have the number, so please don't be a stranger. Thank you. Thank right, you. Right back at you. Mike Doc Emmerich, author of Off Mike, How a Kid from Basketball Crazy Indiana Became America's NHL Voice, the Hall of Famer, here on The Rich Eisen Show.